Ethan's up next to talk about some of our um, research initiatives. All right, thanks everybody for hanging in here. We're, we're headed toward the home stretch. So um, just hang in there here and hopefully we're gonna round this out with a really great uh, discussion that I look forward to moderating. So I want to now talk about um, drug repurposing and biomarker studies, two research activities that uh, I think go hand in hand. And this is uh, sort of an informal structure to this session. So I'll try to also go a little bit faster so we can catch up on time, but also feel free to jump in at, at any moment here. So what do we mean by drug repurposing uh, and biomarker studies at a really high level? Because I'm mindful of our audience here. Uh, uh, so drug, drug repurposing is really just a, another way of saying, you know, old drugs, new tricks. And when we say drugs, we mean anything from an over-the-counter generic, you know, a drug that's been, you know, in, uh, on the World Health Organization list. Um, and it, it could be something that's, you know, actively on patent right now, but for its primary indication. Uh, it could be something that's in a late stage clinical trial, let's say phase three, um, but but for a different indication. Uh, so that's that's drug repurposing. And biomarker studies or biomarker discovery, you know, at the highest level and in the most understandable way, it's taking taking blood, doing a draw, and doing, say, you know, a CMP, a comprehensive uh, metabolite panel. Uh, that that's sort of at a high level. And, and what you might find are that that some metabolite is out of the normal range, and that could you know potentially clue you in on what is a disease mechanism. But it could be confusing because a biomarker, uh, just like we heard before, it's, sometimes it's association, sometimes it's it's causation, and sometimes you have to be careful as to whether the biomarker is actually driving disease or it's just sort of a bystander of the disease state. So that's kind of at the high level. As we start to drill in, you know, it gets more complicated and more nuanced. So on the drug repurposing side. It's not just drugs that are FDA approved. There are also a whole category of compounds called generally recognized as safe molecules, grass compounds. Sometimes they're referred to as nutraceuticals. Some of these are vitamins like, you know, folic acid, vitamin B, et cetera. Um, those are also in play when we talk about drug repurposing. And so you want to make sure when you're doing your drug screens, you include these kinds of compounds. And of course, there's more bio samples, one and specimens one can take from a human, not just blood, uh, urine, saliva. Uh, uh, cerebral spinal fluid in kind of a more invasive uh, setting. And I know, you know, Jill can speak to what, what that is like on the caretaker side and on the sort of, uh, you know, what, what, that, what that has, what, what that is actually like for the families. But there, there are more uh, sort of ways that you can discover biomarkers in, in different parts of the body, different tissues. Then you can also start to start to think about, you know, not just drug repurposing, which is kind of this catch all term, but, but specifically this concept of drug repositioning where you're saying there's a molecule that might have a primary target and its first indication is for some disease, but then we discover that there is a second indication and you, know, you could even fork into other third and fourth indications. Uh, you might also find that a, a molecule has an off target uh, and that leads to a new indication. So, uh, and there's commercial implications for this and, uh, and so forth, but uh, it, 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 it can get actually quite complicated depending on what the molecule is that you find in your screen is helping rescue your disease models. And then on the biomarker side, what are we actually looking for in the different biospecimens? We can look for compounds, metabolites, right? That's the technical term, you know, glucose, uh, cholesterol, stuff like that. You can look for the expression level of genes. Is a, is a particular gene higher or lower? Um, and of course, you can look at the level of a protein. Uh, sometimes the expression of the gene and the protein are correlated, some, sometimes not, um, but usually they are. But you want to investigate you know, at the level of the small molecule, the gene and the protein, what's going on. And, and those are those are kind of the, uh, another category of biomarker. You can have non sort of pharmacological, non pharmaceutical biomarkers, you could have EEGs um, and, and brain waves, and you can measure other things um, other than things that are coming from sort of liquid or, or uh, tissue samples, uh, heart tissue samples. And then it can kind of kind of be a two way street, you can imagine electroceuticals um, delivering a treatment through a, a neural interface. And then, of course, I think as we all would love to imagine one day a future where you basically have a clinical trial on your wrist, where a device can be capturing biomarkers uh, through, you know, more more sophisticated biosensors, uh, some invasive, some non-invasive. Uh, and then, of course, you know, in terms of drug repurposing, we, we think about this as a, a drug, or or, or uh, but it could also be a device actually. Um, and so, just want to make sure that people are mindful of all the ways that you could potentially have a treatment. And I, again, want to just really stress here that, bio, that drug discovery and biomarker studies actually go hand in hand. And even though we've been talking a lot about the gaps and the knowledge gaps we have in FAM, 
you actually have the minimum viable ingredients for, for carrying, carrying forward um, you know, drug repurposing and biomarker discovery in a way that's going to be quite fruitful, potentially. Uh, it's a concept uh, that I talk about a lot um, with my Perlara hat, one to end medicine. You really need to only start with one, and sometimes you only have one family uh, to start out with until you find a few more, and you don't really need more than three to actually, I think, make an impact uh, in terms of actually discovering uh, potential medicine. Uh, I want to sh I'm showing you a picture here of, of a girl, a little girl named Maggie, who this is the day she got the first dose of a drug called a power stat, which we discovered through a set of drug repurposing and biomarker studies. Um, this was a couple of years ago. Now she was the, she was the first patient uh, to receive this drug. And, and now we have a, a, a phase three clinical trial. And what really happened there, just to recap that is we used again, this pairing of drug repurposing and biomarker discovery, discovery uh, studies, they go hand in hand. A hand in glove, really. Uh, and, and so on the drug repurposing side, we created yeast and worm disease models. Those really aren't applicable models here. We're, we're, you know, in, in FAM, we, we're, we're, more, we're using more evolutionarily sophisticated models, but, but the concept's still the same. We use disease models. We rescued their, their, the disease in those models. We found some, some in this case, nutraceuticals. Uh, we also found some interesting structural similarity between the compounds, which is always reassuring. And then we did a little bit of thinking and realized that there was a known drug that had a very similar structure, and we could test in patient fibroblasts and show that the enzyme deficiency uh, could actually be alleviated by this drug. And what does this drug do? Well, this is a drug that was actually developed in Japan. It turns out when you do repurposing, it kind of is a lottery in terms of where, what, what molecule find and what is the history of that molecule and what is it? Uh, this happens to be a drug that was developed in Japan uh, in the 90s for the treatment of diabetic neuropathy in adults. Now, what does that have to do with a kid with an inborn error of metabolism? Well, it turned out uh, we kind of put the, 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 the dots together and realized, well, if this drug that was used to treat diabetic neuropathy in adults, if it, if it does so by lowering the levels of something called sorbitol or these polyols, these sugars that accumulate when you have excess glucose in the body, it made us think, well, if this drug is, is, is useful in this metabolic disease of kids, well, maybe the, this, maybe the biomarker is the same. Uh, and lo and behold, we discovered that sorbitol and mannitol are elevated in, in kids like uh, Maggie, who have PMM2 CDG. And that's something that we found that 80% of, of the kids have that. And that started from an insight from basically one, one patient. And that's actually the endpoint for our clinical trial as well. So it's, it's, it's convenient to find a biomarker study because it, it actually is going to be useful not to tell you, not just objectively tell you that your drug is working, but, but that's how FDA is going to actually assess and evaluate approval. And then just, you know, just to sort of show you where this goes, if you follow a thread and, and where the science can take you, the paper just came out, you know, and this is all a credit to zebrafish work and, and pairing zebrafish with patient cells. We actually figured out mechanistically what's going on and, and how a power stat is working to kind of rebalance metabolism. And again, it started with just a simple set of disease models, one family, kind of a set of connecting of the dots, you know, limited information. There were certainly gaps, but, but enough to kind of create a story. And then it's now, as I said, a phase three clinical trial. We are, have 35 out of 40 patients enrolled in this trial. Um, so we hope to have our data read out at the end of this year. So this is what it looks like if, if, it, if it works out well. And when you pair repurposing and biomarker discovery uh, together, it really can unlock new medicine. Um, and if you really want to take a deep dive on drug repurposing, I would highly recommend checking out the Roadmap Project, which is by a new foundation called Every Cure, which is trying, which whose mission is to say that every drug out there, and there's thousands of drugs out there, their belief, and it's actually my belief too, that every one of those drugs is going to have a second purpose. Um, and they're building AI and other strategies to try to uh, prioritize and uh, figure out what, what, what could work. Uh, and please go to their website if you want to take a deeper dive on drug repurposing. But let's come back here to, to wrap up my section with FAM. So we've heard about mouse model in, in the works. We've heard about all the wonderful insights uh, that, have, uh, that have stemmed from the fish model. Um, we don't have the researcher here today, but Clement Chow from University of Utah uh, works a lot with fly models uh, and is actually in the works of uh, in, in the process of potentially uh, validating a fly model that we could run with. Um, so that would obviously be a, a very a fleet of foot uh, model that we could use to generate uh, hits. We also just heard a wonderful talk about on the cell biology side, very, very, very detailed and mechanistic um, uh, sort of model here where when you take cells, and this is the, the Golgi here, a representation of the Golgi, and you treat them with that drug Berfeldin A, you get this, uh, this dispersal, this disease phenotype. And the recovery time, um, uh, in other words, how long it takes the disease cell to recover, that could be the basis of a drug screen. And we could ask, are there molecules that hasten that recovery, that make the, 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 the FAM knockout cells 
their, makes their Golgi recover faster after Brafeldin washout. That's a perfectly viable screening option. Uh, and of course, we could validate hits that come from those cell-based screens in the animal models that have already been developed or that could be developed. And then on the biomarker side, we really want to run with the Fagenbaum playbook. Um, and that's really uh, all credit to this uh, individual here, Dr. David Fagenbaum, who wrote a book called Chasing My Cure. Jill met him at a conference recently and I can attest to uh, his force of nature, but he has a disease called Castleman syndrome. And um, when it kind of crashed onto his life, he was actually in medical school. Uh, and he took it upon himself to, from first principles, try to understand what is going on with this disease. And he ended up creating a research collaborative network that Jill is also, I think, inspired by. And in many ways, I think this this organization, this fan community, is is hopefully you know learning the lessons, the wonderful lessons of of the Castleman Group and of David Fagenbaum. So shout out to to David. Please get by his book and read it. It's very inspiring. And also Every Cure. He's actually the founder of Every Cure, that that group that I just told you about that has. Um, this effort here to use AI to, to find a, a second or more purpose for, for every known drug. Um, so definitely he's an inspiration, I think, to, to many in the rare disease world. And, and where he's really a specific insp inspiration is on the biomarker discovery side, because he was able to take advantage of a, of a, of a platform technology uh, called Proteomics, where you can measure the level of many, 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 many proteins at once. And there's a company called Somologic that, that has developed this technology and has deployed it across you know, many, many, many numbers of people. And they can measure the level of 7,000 different proteins and tell you what the kind of normal range is and whether something would be diseased. And we can use a very straightforward case, what's called a case control study. Um, and here I'm just showing you the pedigrees of the three families uh, that we've been talking about. Um, and you know, the simplest way to run a case control study would be to take the cases, take all the affected, uh, and 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 they're in kind of their samples get grouped into one bucket and take a bunch of con controls and those clearly could be family controls unaffected sibs and maybe bring in uh, other age match controls who may not be genetically uh, of the same background but that's another way to sort of give a, a bucket of folks who are not fam. Um, and then the idea would be to look and see what proteins are different. And Fagenbaum um, did this with, with for, for Castleman disease in his own samples and really basically actually him and two other patients. And it was really three it was that kind of magic number that was enough to really see something and, and, and uh, see a, a glimmer of, of something that they could latch onto that led to a drug treatment option, which led to a remission and an understanding of his disease. So the playbooks out there um, and the kind of pairing between repurposing and biomarkers, I think, really is a, um, a fruitful path forward as shown by the examples I've highlighted. So thanks, everybody, for your attention here. And we can follow up on these points in the um, in the session at the very end. Or if anyone has any questions at the moment, please bring it up. Otherwise, we will kind of go back into our speaker queue so we can round things out.